asking our speaker, Dr. Ali Pasmo, for coming on. We can't wait for the command. It's a very good administrative case. I'm looking forward to hearing what you have to say tonight. Thank you. Thank you. It's been a great joy to have David to lead our worship this evening. And uh, I would just like to underscore the welcome that he's given to you all. It's been a lovely week together. Young people have joined us and uh, older people, some old crocs about my age. Like me, I'm an old croc as well. Uh, but we're delighted to have you. God bless you, everyone. We couldn't be in a better place than gathered around an open Bible and under the instruction and help of the Holy Spirit. He's the great revealer. He's the great teacher. Remember, he said, I will take of the things of Christ and reveal them unto you. Now, one or two have been speaking after the meeting of blessing received and light received. One of the things which uh, sometimes comes up is, will we have to go through the great tribulation? And I was going to speak tonight on why the Bible my understanding from almost a lifetime of study uh, convinces me that we shall not go through the Great Tribulation. But as uh, is stated in 1 Thessalonians 1.10, that the Lord Jesus Christ, we wait for God's Son from heaven, who delivered us from the wrath to come, and uh, even Jesus who delivers us from the wrath to come, that we shall not go through that time. Now in Romans 8, and we won't look it up, I just mention this very briefly, do you remember Paul launches into a great catalogue of calamities. What shall separate us from the love of Christ, the love of God which is in Christ? Tribulation, distress, peril, sword, nakedness. He goes through a whole catalogue of calamities which can befall believers. And I think it's the next, a third verse from the end. He mentions neither things present or things to come nor life, nor death, nor any other creature will be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. The Savior there says, nothing up ahead, things to come, will possibly be able to separate a believer from the love of Christ. So, whatever the future holds, I suppose if we did have to go through the tribulation, the Lord would keep us. He will be there. Nothing up ahead will be able to separate us from his love anyway. But my submission to you is that the scripture teaches that we shall not go through that time. Now having said that, just a couple of things to mention on the bookstall, bookstand. As you leave this evening, it's uh, on the left, and young James, he's been my sales assistant. He's pretty good. Could do with him coming around everywhere with me. But he's busy at school. This evening, and he will serve you, and this evening, that book from Bridges for Peace about Israel, it's called Israel and the Church, God's Roadmap. Now, it's a long time since I stocked a book like this. I sell a lot of books. I read all the books that I sell, and that really is a very, very full uh, exposition of the future of Israel. We're living in the days of the doctrine, the, the, the theology of replacement, supersessionism, as it's called in theology, and it's very, very sad, and it robs God's people of a right view of the future of God's earthly people, uh, ethnic Israel, gathering back in the biblical land of promise. You will know that they're gathering back in the land of Israel the ancient land of Canaan, their ancient homeland, in the teeth of global opposition, setting the scene for the final battle for, wor for the world, World War III, which will be the Battle of Armageddon. They're stoking up for it, but thank God he's in charge. And that book will really help you to understand God's plan for the nation of Israel and the relation of Israel to the church. It's packed with beautiful photography of various aspects of life, Jewish life, and bi but biblical uh, Jewish life. And then I mentioned on Monday, uh, these are seven final facts, and they are uh, recordings, uh, DVDs, uh, uh, sound and vision, of seven messages which I gave each evening in the hotel in Bournemouth last year at the Prophetic Witness Conference. 
Number one, waiting for God's Son from heaven, His imminent return, imminency and His vital motivation. And then number two, the day the church goes home. We thought about that night before last here, the rapture, its timing, what will happen. And then number three, very important, 2 Peter 1, 9, the more sure word of prophecy, the utter inspiration and sufficiency of the scriptures of truth. And that's on here, God's controversy with the nations. Again, the destiny of Israel, the divine restrainer and the man of sin. And I finished up with the throne rights of Jesus Christ, a message about his thousand year reign. That's on the bookstall tonight. Do have a look. And if you'd like to take something, um, I'm sorry, like I say every night, I wish I could be Father Christmas and give you all one. I'm afraid that's four DVDs, I think. Um, and yeah, four D DVDs. Those are just 11 pounds. Th that's all on our bookstall this evening. Now, I think that's all I needed to say, except to say thank you. David was thanking me for coming. Uh, tomorrow night is our closing night, and we're looking forward to that. And I want to speak tomorrow night about the Christian's new body, the resurrection body. In Romans chapter 8, the Apostle Paul says, there are three groans, aren't there? There's the groaning of the Holy Spirit, and there's the groaning of creation. And then he says, even we who have the first fruits of the Spirit, we groan within ourselves, waiting for the adoption of the body. Our souls are saved here, but our bodies are still under the curse. But one day when the Lord comes, we shall have a new body. And praise God, it'll be a body like unto His lovely body, a body in which we will be able to spend eternity with Christ. We cannot spend eternity with Christ in this body, but this body will be the same body, but be, it will become spiritual, it will be changed, and from the seed of this body, committed to the ground, unless the rapture comes, unless the Savior comes first, from the seed of this body will be raised a new body, which will be everlasting, but will still be me. We will know each other in heaven. Don't miss tomorrow night. Thank you so much for coming so regularly. So many of you have come. Some of you have come every night, and it's been really good. And uh, I appreciate your attendance and your lovely fellowship. You're a great bunch here in uh, Kilkeel and in the tabernacle here too. Of course, I was stopped in a great hotel. You know that, don't you? It's second to none, and I'm grateful to Harvey and Anne for looking after me. I think next week I'll have to go on hunger strike or something because uh, the food at the hotel I've stayed in is really good. And it's been good to meet some of you out in the town and to say, hi brother, hi brother. And the people here are so friendly and I thank you very, very much. And somebody was saying last night, or was it the night before, how this year people haven't had so many colds. Well, that's okay for you, but I've had a really bad cold. But praise God, I, I got it kicked into touch before I came here. And I haven't had one since I came here. So that's, that's very good. Where I come from in Devon, there's a little village called With Witherstone, or something like that, where they say the devil died of a cold. <laughs> well, that's an old little tradition, Devonshire, where I come from. If the devil died of a cold there, I'd like to know who's carrying the business on. Uh, the devil's in business, all right. But, you know, there was a little lady in England, she had a terrible cold. Sunday after Sunday, she'd be sneezing and doing this, and, the, and they were all fed up. One Sunday, the pastor said to her, you know, dear, you, you should get rid of that cold. Oh, no, she says, how can I get rid of it? He says, you need to have a thing called echinacea. Have you heard of that? Echinacea, a little drop of bottles of drops. Echinacea, what's it called, she said? Echinacea, said the pastor. Where would you get it? Boots the chemist. She says, I'll be there in the morning. She was at Boots the chemist, and she said, I've come to ask for something. I hope I remember it correctly. Our, our pastor's a, such a kind man. I've got a terrible cold, and he's recommending euthanasia. Uh, can, you, can you please give me a bottle of that? <laughs> well, folks, it's good to smile sometimes, and... Uh, yeah, I suppose euthanasia, cure your cold, all right, if you got that. Well, thank you for listening. Now, we're going to turn to the scriptures of truth. 
I've been so pleased every night to see believers, young people, and old crocs like I say, senior years like me, turning over the pages of the Word. The only authority we have for believing anything is the authority of the book God wrote for us, and He wrote it by divine inspiration. And in just a second, we're going to turn to it. But before I direct you to the New Testament, I want to tell you that in my first church, we had some real saints of God. Been privileged to serve in Bible churches across England. And in our first church, I served for 10 years. Our, our children were both small. There was a little lady who, who was a great Christian and she loved the Lord so much. We, all of us, respected her very, very much. She was a holy, godly woman who walked with God. And I preached a certain sermon one day, and uh, I don't know that she was pleased with it. She didn't say so. Not that we want to please anybody with what we do. I don't think I was pleased with it. I don't remember. But she placed in my hand a little piece of paper which has yellowed and faded long ago and is gone. But I never forgot what she wrote on it. Whether this is in a book or whether she composed it, I don't know. But this is what that dear little lady, she's been in the glory with the Savior now for years. This is what she wrote. I'm satisfied with Jesus, as satisfied can be. But the question keeps recurring, is he satisfied with me? Challenge, isn't it? Will you turn in your Bibles to Romans chapter 14? And we're at verse 10, friends. Romans chapter 14, verse 10, and then we're going to turn back to 1 Corinthians chapter 3, reading from verse 1. So will you come with me please, first of all, to Romans chapter 14, and we're at verse 10. Paul writes, But why dost thou judge thy brother? Or why dost thou set at naught thy brother? I want you to see what he writes next. For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. And we note, friends, that Paul must be in the we when he says we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. He's including himself, we. He's in it. Will you turn back then to 1 Corinthians chapter 3? Forward, sorry, to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. And we're at verse 1. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, Paul's letter to the Corinthians chapter 3 verse 1. And I, brethren, could not speak unto you as unto spiritual, but as, as unto carnal, even as unto babes in Christ. I have fed you with milk, and not with meat, and hitherto ye were not able to bear it, neither yet are ye now able. For ye are yet carnal, for whereas there is among you envying, and strife, and divisions, are you not carnal, and walk as men? While one saith, I am of Paul, and another, I am of Apollos, are ye not carnal? Who then is Paul, and who is Apollos, but ministers, by whom ye believed, even as the Lord gave to every man. I have planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. So then neither is he that planteth anything, neither he that watereth, but God that giveth the increase. Now he that planteth and he that watereth are one. And every man shall receive his own reward according to his own labor. For we are laborers together with God. A lovely expression. Ye are God's husbandry, ye are God's building. According to the grace of God which is given unto me, as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation, and another buildeth thereon. But let every man take heed, that is, take care, how he buildeth thereon. For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. I want you, brothers and sisters, to follow here. Now, if any man build upon this foundation, Gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble. That's a contrast of materials. Every man's work shall be made manifest. For the day, and in the Greek Bible, 
New Testament, a capital D, a special designated day. The day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire, and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. If any man's work abide, which he hath built thereupon, he shall receive a reward, that is, in that day, that's mentioned. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. Know ye not that ye are the temple of God, and that the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit, dwelleth in you? If any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy, for the temple of God is holy, which temple ye are. Go down, please, to chapter 4, and one verse, uh, verse 5. Chapter 4, chapter 4, verse 5. Therefore judge nothing before the time. What time is he meaning? Well, until the Lord comes, who both will bring to light the hidden things of darkness, and will make manifest the counsels of the hearts. And then shall every man have praise of God. I wish to read that verse again. I hope you don't mind. 1 Corinthians 4 verse 5. Therefore judge nothing before the time until the Lord come. Who both will bring to light the hidden things of darkness. It refers to the hidden motives of our service for Christ. The hidden secret motives of why we do what we do for the Lord. And will make manifest the counsels of the hearts and then shall every man have praise of God. Well, may the Lord bless to our understanding those uh, very challenging scriptures from the New Testament. Brothers and sisters, I want to speak tonight to you and to myself and address preacher and congregation together on what is, I think, the most challenging and arresting aspect of the coming of Christ. Jesus is coming again. The glories of that coming for believers we looked at on Tuesday. And the dread of that coming for those who are outside of Christ. We thought about last night. The, that awful expression used by the Lord Jesus. The great tribulation. It has ten names in scripture. The best known is in Matthew 24. Then shall be great tribulation such as was not since the world began. And we thought about all these things. But tonight, friends, I want to speak to you as the Lord in His grace may help me and bless me about the most challenging aspect of the return of Christ. That is, respecting believers, the New Testament Church of Jesus Christ. Because I'm going to talk to you about the judgment seat of Christ. And in Romans 14.10, we read, we, all believers, must appear at the judgment seat of Christ. This word, we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, we could have read on three, uh, in three other locations, four times. Paul writes, we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. I mentioned last evening that the second advent and the truth of the end times the blessed hope, Titus 2, which is before us, is not merely for information. It's for transformation. It is to help make us godly people, holy people, prepared people, a people waiting and watching and working. And it's also, we saw last night, to fire our witness to a doomed world that will be left behind when the church has gone and to teach us knowing therefore the terrors to come to persuade men we saw in 2 Corinthians last night the attitude of our hearts and the expectation for the coming of the Lord Jesus should not be something that we merely look at we're not taught to look at the coming of Christ but we're taught to look for the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ this gives us, as I've said, holy expectation and readiness for His coming. The Scripture says, What manner of persons ought you to be? 
in the light of his coming in all holy conversation and godliness, looking for and hasting unto the coming of the day of God. The Apostle John in chapter, in his first epistle, chapter 3, he says, and every man, means every believer, who hath this hope, this uh, future expectation in him, in Christ, purifies himself. Even as he is pure, the coming of the Lord is our blessed hope. And it's a purifying hope. When it's preached in the church, it's to make the church holy. He that hath it, and, and to purify us, purifies himself. So let's ask the question in, in, uh, as we open up, what is the judgment seat of Christ? Many of you who love the Word, some of you are Bible teachers, been teaching the Word longer than I have, will know that in the Greek New Testament, it's a very, very interesting word, uh, the judgment seat. In the Greek Bible, it's the bima seat, the bima throne. It refers to a kind of a platform or a podium that presided over the Olympic Games, very familiar to the Apostle Paul, the ancient world of Judaism, and of course the Greeks and the Olympians and so on. And Paul says we must all appear before the Bema seat. What is the Bema seat? Well now, Bible expert Dr. Lehman Strauss uh, says it much better than I can. He quotes, and I quote, in the large Olympic arenas, there was an elevated, important seat on which the judge of the contests sat. When the race was finished, successful competitors would, would assemble before, they walked, before what they called the Bema seat. There it is, the Bema seat, to receive their rewards or crowns. The Bema seat was not a judicial bench where someone was condemned. Now I'll come a little bit more to that in a moment. It was a reward seat. So it wasn't a judicial bench where you could be sent to prison or even condemned to death. Nothing to do with that kind of a thing. It was a reward seat where accolades, rewards were given out to those who had run the races well. And then continues Dr. Lehman Strauss, likewise, the judgment seat of Christ is not a legal judicial judgment. The Christian, he continues, is in a race. And the divine umpire is watching every contestant. After the church has run her course, he will gather every member before his bema seat for the purpose of examining each one and giving the proper reward. And I hope this evening as we continue to probe the scriptures, we will see that actually one of the purposes for the coming of Christ to the air for his church in that first dramatic stage or pays of the second coming. He will come first to the air. We saw when he comes, one of the purposes of that is to reward his servants, is to deliver us from the wrath of the tribulation period. Yes, but it is also to reward his servants. We will see that scripture in a moment. Now, it cannot be emphasized, friends, too strongly that the Bema seat, and I've already mentioned this, is not to decide heaven or hell. When I was brought up, I thought, well, everybody dies, whether you're a Christian or not. And when you die, you come before a big judgment, and then you find out whether you're going to heaven or hell. Friends, that is not correct. And the Bema seat is not to decide heaven or hell, or our final destiny, because this was already decided and determined on the day the Lord saved us. How wonderful that the day you and I were saved, not only were we were saved from our sins past, not only did we receive a new life. Praise God, the gospel doesn't offer a new leaf. That's how the secularists talk. The offer of the gospel is of a new life. It begins at the cross. It survives the grave and is perfected in eternity. Yes, our destiny was fixed forever because of the cross. The Lord Jesus said in John 5, 24, 
Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that heareth my word and believeth on him that hath sent me hath everlasting life, and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. Another text which seems to give the clear message that we shall not be condemned with the world. We shall escape the wrath. And how wonderful, shall not come into condemnation, John 5, 24, but is passed from death unto life. Ah, but those who die unrepentant and in willful rejection of the love and salvation Christ died to give to the world and gave his life for their eternal salvation will not be brought in eternity in the future to the judgment seat of Christ. This is for the we, for the Apostle Paul, we must all, it's for believers. But there's another judgment for those who die without Jesus Christ. Those who depart this life in continued and willful rejection of his love, his salvation, of his claims. They will come up, we won't study it tonight, at what the scripture calls in Revelation 20, the great white throne judgment. That is the judgment of the unbelieving dead the great white throne. And even as I speak those words to you, in my spirit there comes a happy reassurance. Thank the Lord because of Calvary. I shall never stand at the great white throne. He saved me from that. I shall not come into condemnation. But what an awful, awful assize will be the great white throne. If I understand the Bible correctly, the bulk of the human race will stand there. The multitudes who lived and died in willful rejection of Christ. It's in Revelation 20, we won't look it up now. Verses 11 to 15. The unbelieving and now resurrected dead will have no hope. They will be brought to the great white throne and then will be consigned to what the Bible calls the second death. Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection. Over such the second death has no power, writes that same chapter. But those who will be resurrected, unbelievers will have a resurrection as well as believers. But a thousand years after us, they, friends, will be raised at the end of the thousand year reign of Christ and will appear before that awful, great, white throne. There will be no hope for them. They will be resurrected to look into the face of the man who had loved them, died for them, gave his life for their eternal salvation, but whose gospel they rejected. There will be no hope for them. They will be resurrected to see him and receive his judgment. He will say, depart from me, I never knew you, into everlasting fire reserved for the devil and his angels. Friends, what a terrible thing to live and die without Christ. Ephesians 2 says, the unsaved are without God and without hope. And if you don't know the Lord Jesus tonight, I hope that you will come to him. Seek him. He said, if you seek me with all your heart, you will find me. And he's a living, personal savior. Friends, here tonight, Jesus Christ is as real as I am. And you can know him and find him as a living, personal Savior. So the lost will come up at the great white throne. But we, Romans 14, 10, the believers, Paul and all who trust the redeeming blood of the cross, we will never be there. But we must all appear before the Bema seat where the divine umpire, Layman Strauss called him, the one who's watching us, running our earthly pilgrimage, our earthly race, watching each day how we live, what we do, how we respond, how we conduct, our, conduct ourselves, how we deal with others, how we speak with others. He is watching us. I want to say to you quickly this evening, the judgment seat of Christ will test our works and our service. Not a judgment of our souls. They're already eternally safe in God's salvation if we truly are saved and belong to Christ. But in 1 Corinthians 3, and I direct you back again to 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 13. See what it says, friends. 
every man's work, that is, every believer's service, shall be made manifest for the day, and it's the day when the Lord returns to the air for his own, the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire, and the fire will try every man's work of what sort it is. If any man's work abide, which he hath built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. Now no believer will stand at the great white throne. Our sins are gone. But the Bible teaches me that I will appear before this judgment seat, the Bema seat, where my works, or lack of works, what I did for Jesus, what I did not do for Jesus, will be tested by the fire of his presence at the judgment seat of Christ. At the judgment seat of Christ, we shall give an account for the gifts, time, and opportunity the Lord gave us here and how we use them. We all have gifts from the Lord. We can all do things. I think we can all witness for the Lord. I'll put this in just here. It's not in my notes this evening. But surely we can talk about so many things. Why should we not talk about Jesus? At the judgment seat, I don't think we'll be condemned if we never led a soul to Christ. I think we might be if we didn't try to. If we didn't seek to witness the glory of the gospel which saved us, the witness of the Christian, it will come up at the judgment seat of Christ and the opportunities that we had to speak a word for the gospel. And even more than that, our attitudes. Here we are warned that the work of some believers will be found of no value. Some believers will stand before the judgment seat of Christ and their works and their service in the church will amount to nothing. It will be burned up with fire. The Bible teaches me that the works that we do for the Lord may be simply wood and hay and stubble. They're combustible. No good. What the Lord seeks is the precious stones of real heart service for Christ. And it, we're warned here that the works of some believers will be burned up. On that day it will be revealed who were serving Christ really in sincerity and who were not. The wood, hay and stubble of service in the flesh or to be seen by men will be no good. The Christian whose works are burned up will still be saved, will still go to heaven because of the finished work of the cross. It is horribly possible, and I'm preaching to me, as I am to you, for a man, a woman, who's a believer to have a saved soul, but a lost life. It's possible to have a saved soul and a lost life. I remember here in the north of Ireland, 20, perhaps more years ago, 25 years ago, a sweet sister singing a beautiful song. Do you know this one? I think you will. By and by, when I look on his face, beautiful face, thorn crown face, by and by, when I look on his face, I wish I had given him more. And I remember the sword of God's conviction that went into my heart. What will be my regret when I meet the Lord? What will be my regret when the Lord comes? What will be my regret when I see the Lord Jesus? Will my regret be I gave him too much of my life? <laughs> no. My regret will be that I didn't give him more, right? That I didn't serve him better, right? And here we find this great challenge connected with the imminent return of Jesus Christ. The judgment seat will test the hidden motives of our hearts. The service of believers, the motives will be made manifest. The day will declare it. We will find out when the Lord Jesus comes to take us home, as soon as we are taken home to heaven, remember, in the twinkling of an eye, 
soon we must appear before the judgment seat of Christ. While the tribulation years pass on earth, we shall be in heaven. First of all, at the judgment seat, and then at the marriage supper, where the bride had made herself ready by appearing at the judgment seat of Christ. We haven't time to go into that this evening, but we shall all appear before the judgment seat of Christ soon after that glorious um, rapture when we'll be taken to be with the Lord and our works will be tried with fire. The wood, the hay, the stubble. Why, that's the things I did to be seen by men. The things I did for personal aggrandizement. The things I did to be praised by men. You know, preachers like me, we have to remember Beware when all men speak well of thee. We can even get to seek the praise of men. You know, I read once of a preacher and uh, he preached the gospel or preached a, a, the message of the word. And when he got to the door back there, like I shall go later and then the pastors do, I, he got to the door and there was a man that left his seat very quickly and he, he got to the door just as the pastor reached the door and he said, Pastor, that was fantastic. That's the best sermon I ever heard preached. He says, I know I've already been told. Oh, he said, I don't think so. I was the first at the door. Oh, he says, the devil's already told me what you say. The devil's already told me. We must be very careful not to love the praise of men, lest our service be wood and hay and stubble pleasing men but not pleasing Jesus on the day when he comes the judgment seat the hidden motives of our hearts will be revealed you see brothers and sisters here this evening thank you all for coming well God, I'm getting to love this dear fellowship and so many friends that join us see listen it isn't what I do for the Lord Jesus in the church. That is important, but something far more important. Not just what I do for the Lord, but, what, but why I do what I do. Have you got it? Not just what I do, but why I do it. And it's the hidden motives that God sees. He tries the heart. And on the day when he comes, it will be revealed whether we were really serving Christ or ourselves or looking for the praise of men or the approbation of leaders. Yes, Paul says ye serve the Lord Christ. Keep him there. Keep him in your vision and make sure that your motive is pure. You're serving the Lord and no man can be served two masters. Paul says if I serve men I shall not be the servant of God. If we serve the Lord, we shall not be serving men. We respect others and we serve others too. But first of all, we serve the Lord. I remember years ago when I was a young man, I was holding a gospel mission uh, in England. I think it was in Derbyshire, somewhere like that. And I don't come from the north of England. I'm from down in the southwest, as I think I explained. Halfway through the mission, the congregations were sort of drooping a little bit. And we were wondering how we could get more people in. And the pastor says, well, there's a very fine Christian woman that lives in this village that is a famous singer. And she sings on the BBC. And she doesn't come to this church. I don't know which church she goes to. But she's a Christian. She's a Christian. And if you asked her to come, I think she might come and sing. And if she was to sing, the place would be full. Good idea. Well, some fell for it. And they went and asked this Christian to come sing. I'll never forget, I was the preacher that night, and I sat down in the front as this lady sang. She came in a long, flowing robe that glittered all the way as she walked up to the pulpit, to go like this, like fireworks going off in the dress. <laughs> and when she sung, she stood like a, prof a pr professional, trained singer, sang on the BBC, put her hands like this and she looked around like this at the people and my goodness me she had a marvelous voice she sang with this great voice that filled the place 
And I thought, my, that's a, that's a remarkable voice, that woman's come. And they asked her to come each night of the rest of the mission. One night, I said to this lady, I didn't seem to get too friendly with, very friendly, couldn't get very friendly with. I said to her, dear Mrs. So-and-so, on uh, Thursday, uh, tomorrow, there's one of the boys from the college, one of the students, like you, I have to be very careful. I said, like you, he's got a very good singing voice. I didn't say, he's got a very good singing voice. She could have took it that I thought she didn't, got it? So I said to her, like you, Mrs. So-and-so, he's got a beautiful singing voice to sing for the Lord. Uh, the boy arrived the next night, but she didn't turn up. She didn't like it. She thought she should have been asked to sing every night. Friends, I cannot judge the secrets of a woman, a man's heart, a believer's heart. But I always remember that woman. Why did she sing like this? Reminds me of the young student from our college that went to take a service. And he was a little bit like that, a little bit sort of, uh, do you people here in Northern Ireland know that the expression hoity-toity? Do you know what that means? Do you? Hoity-toity. Sort of a, people that have a high opinion of themselves and it shows. And uh, he was a bit like that. He thought he'd been to college and he knew it all. Uh, a young upstart and he came, went up the pulpit like this. And he, he thought he was really the cat's whiskers. Do you know that as well? Hoity-toity. You know, he had an inflated idea of what he could do. This congregation's very, very privileged to have me to speak here tonight. That kind of a guy, you know, one, one of them. <laughs> and I knew him well. But he told me when he got up in the pulpit, he dropped the Bible first off. And then he lost his place in his notes. And then he dropped his notes and then he dropped the hymn book. He made an utter hash of all the service. So that when he went down the stairs, he didn't go down the stairs like that. He went down like this, his head down. <laughs> As a dear old Christian said to him, you know, young fella, if you'd have gone up those steps in the way you come down the steps, you might have made a better thing of the service. <laughs> God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. And friends, in our service for Christ, we must be sure we're really serving him because we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ and the day will declare it. It will really find out uh, who we are serving and above all, uh, why. When will this take place? Will you turn to Luke 14 and verse 14 in your Bibles? These are Bible messages night by night. Luke's Gospel, chapter 14. And we're at verse 14, please. Luke 14 and verse 14. I have a lot of verses here, but we'll just read this one. Verse 13, to get the sense of verse 14. But when thou makest a feast, call the poor, the maimed, the lame, and the blind, not people that are going to invite you back again with more, and thou shalt be blessed, for they cannot recompense thee, for thou shalt be recompensed at the resurrection of the just. See what Paul is teaching? See what I'm trying to show you this evening? The day will declare it. You will be, you'll get your payback. You do something for the Lord and for people that can't give it back to you, that's good. That's good. Because you will be reconciled. You will be recompensed at the resurrection of the just or the justified. Do you know, friends, I think that one of the greatest things we can do in the body of Christ is to do a work for the Lord and somebody else gets the praise for it. That's good. So that we don't do it for our own glory and our own praise, but we do it for Jesus. And will you turn, please, to Revelation 22 and verse 12. Right through to the end of your Bible. Revelation chapter 22. And we're at verse 12. The Lord is speaking. You have a red letter edition of the New Testament. Revelation 22 and verse 12. Behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me, to give to every man according as his work shall be. Now we cannot be saved by works. We're saved by grace alone. We're saved through the finished work and the blood of the cross. 
but there will be a reward or a lack of reward for our service and he will come to reward his servants when we are called up to meet him how will this affect us and others go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 3 friends one go forward to 1 Corinthians chapter 3 we have read it and it's sorry verse 4 and verse 5 we read it 1 Corinthians chapter 4 and we're at verse 5 therefore judge nothing before the time what's Paul teaching well until the Lord comes who both will bring to light the hidden things of darkness that is the secret motives of the hearts of Christians and will make manifest the counsels of the hearts and then shall every man have praise of God don't judge anything before the time is that man really doing what he's doing in a proper way that sister that brother judge nothing before the time until the Lord comes who shall bring to light the hidden things of darkness when he comes when Jesus returns we shall know what was really in the secret motives of the heart of the Christian you and me do you know this I'm sure you do a little couplet only one life twill soon be passed and only what's done for Christ will last do you know that that's stinging and it's truth only what is done for Christ will last the precious stones a real heart service for the Lord all the rest is for fleshly reasons all the rest is wood and hay and stubble and this will be revealed at the judgment seat of Christ brothers and sisters may we live in the light of eternity may we serve in the light of eternity may we serve in the church amongst in the assembly may we serve on the streets and in our homes not to be seen of men not to be praised of men but may we serve to be that day when he will come to receive praise of God we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ now my message is a little shorter this evening but I've not quite finished and I invite you to listen a moment longer once uh, not very long ago I was reading through a magazine and I read the story of a young man in England that really challenged me may it challenge you tonight a young English boy a brilliant musician at school university he went right to the top he entered the London Royal Academy of Music if you get an LRAM after your name you're somebody in the field of classical music he got right to the top a brilliant young musician now I did have his name in that book but I'm afraid I have sort of lost it but this young boy he was really brilliant and his music his piano uh, expositions were sought after he he became quite famous one day he received what might be called an ultimate accolade he received a letter from Canada from the Boston Symphony Orchestra they have a huge place there I've been in Boston but I didn't see that but the orchestra trained full-time one of the greatest symphony orchestras in the world what an accolade he received would he come and play Rachmaninoff one of his most familiar works he was brilliant at Rachmaninoff what a brilliant young man he was of course he applied in the affirmative and within a few months he traveled to Canada and he met the conductor and he met the orchestra several days of practice preparation thousands would listen to the rendition that they all would bring and the young pianist would take a, a leading part on that superb piano all linked up to electronics all over the auditorium and when he played and when the orchestra accompanied him their exposition of Rachmaninoff lifted the Americans out of their seat they were ecstatic 
When he finished, they leapt to their feet and began to shout and bawl and shout, more, more, like this, American style. And I read in the, this article in the magazine how this young man, uh, he was the guest of the night at the piano. You know, they have this ritual they go through three times this way, and then three times over here, and then three times bowing to the crowds before whom you had performed. And he went through all that. And then he went through the little curtain with the conductor and they got him behind. And then he says, come on, we have to do this again. It's the ritual. So they went out and as the crowds were hollering and clapping and shouting more, more, he went out and he bowed again. Oh, he, he felt really good this way and in the front and over here. And then he disappeared again back to where the conductor was. And the conductor said, I tell you what, son, let's go back in again. The orchestra is still seated. The people are yelling for more. Big money here tonight. Come on, we'll go in and give them 10 more minutes of Rachmaninoff. But the young boy looked at the conductor and he says, no, I can't do it. Come on, come on. Not very long. We'll go in and give them, what's wrong with, no, I can't do it. Why not? Why won't you go in? Come on, let's go. No, I can't do it. Why not? He says to the conductor, peep through this chink in this curtain. Yep. Can you see in the balcony, just right across in this big auditorium, a man sitting with a bald head and glasses, a little man sitting down. The conductor looked through. He says, yeah, I can see him. He's the only man in the place not standing. Who's that? Ah, said the young pianist. You see, he's my tutor. And until he stands, I haven't done it right. Got it? Now there's coming a day when it won't matter one little bit what people thought about us, whether they applauded us, clapped us, or liked us, or licked us. Coming a day when it won't matter what the world thought about us. The only thing that will count is what Jesus Christ thought about us. And he's watching us. We're in the race. And every day, we're running the race that is set before us. The letter to the Hebrews, let us run with patience, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. The second coming will be glory for the saints, gloom for those outside of Christ. But it will be a great challenge for us. For Romans 14.10 says, we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. And in 1 John 1.28, it speaks of those who may be ashamed before him at his coming. May we not only have saved souls, but saved lives. May we give ourselves to the service of Jesus. The world needs us. The world is waiting for us. Let's go and serve him from this week and make sure that when the Lord comes, he'll come to reward us. That when he comes, our service will be nothing but the precious stones of real motivation, heart service for the glory of the man who died to save us. Shall we have a little prayer together? Would you kindly bow your head in prayer?